morning everyone. I'm uh, so glad you're able to join us this morning. Welcome to the Bethesda Baptist Church Sunday School Hour, Fruit Bear Sunday School class. Uh, we are continuing our study of why do I need the church? This is, session, this is the second session in this series, and it's entitled, We Pray for One Another. The uh, point of our lesson today is the church is strengthened as we pray. As we as Christians join together and pray for each other and for the church, it helps strengthen our church and our fellowship. Let's open in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many gifts that you have provided for us, especially the gift of prayer, Lord. We come to you humbly this morning, praising you, seeking your forgiveness, and thanking you for allowing us to fellowship with you through prayer. We know that we should pray for others, not just ourselves that our prayer life should include the well-being of other Christians and non-Christians and that we pray for our leaders and we broaden our prayer horizon beyond just our selfish concerns and desires for our own comfort or gratification. We uh, thank you for showing us how. We thank you for the model of prayer. We thank you for teaching us how to pray and reminding us, especially through this lesson, that we need to pray for each other more so than just ourselves. We ask that you be with those that are sick. We ask you be with those that have this coronavirus, that you will protect them, heal them, return them back to their normal life as soon as possible, Lord. That you will protect those that have not gotten it uh, from ever receiving or enduring the curse of this pandemic. We know you have the power and we know that you have the love for mankind that would uh, cause you to want to fulfill these requests and to do away with this pandemic. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> If you look at your uh, personal study guide, page 110, the question there is, what are some of your favorite group hobbies or pastimes? Shows a picture, looks like people hiking. Uh, some people uh, like to walk. Some people like to run. Some people like to exercise. Uh, all these things can be fun, but they can be more fun in a group or at least with company. Uh, people have hobbies. Uh, and, uh, I have never had a hobby, but some people have hobbies of uh, maybe woodworking or needlepoint or first one thing or another that they do to relax themselves and to uh, provide some uh, peace and, and, and uh, enjoyment. Some things are just better done with a group, as I said earlier. It's one thing to grab a basketball and shoot hoops, but you can't really have a basketball game without a team. So, and it says here that almost 60 million people run for exercise and almost 111 million walk for the same reason. The discipline is commendable, yet many more decide to run or walk each year only to quit after a few weeks or even a few days. What causes people to stick it out and others to quit? Well, we might suggest many reasons a great motivation can be the presence of others. It's easy to say, I've gone far enough when you're by yourself. 
but runners are great at encouraging each other to keep going. Marathon runners are known for verbally high-fiving each other. They know it's hard and they support one another. Their strength in numbers. The truth applies to our prayer lives as well. God certainly hears the prayer of a solitary individual, but we experience something wonderful when we gather together with others to pray. As a church, we need one another and we support one another through our prayers. For many people, prayer is something they use when they need something specific and concrete for themselves. Prayer encompasses more than that. Even as we pray for our own needs, we ought to pray for others. Give us this day our daily bread. We have an opportunity to pray for one another in relational and spiritual matters. As a church, we need one another. We support one another through our prayers. The passage of the, the, our lesson today is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. The uh, setting for this lesson was Paul was a prayer. He prayed a lot. He prayed for the churches he established. He encouraged other Christians to pray for him and other needs in their locals. In their locals. He urged them to pray regularly. One of the most famous prayers is his request for divine deliverance from the thorn in his flesh, 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. God did not remove the thorn, but Paul learned to rely on God's power in his struggles. Our first uh, scriptures today are from chapter 3, verses 14 through 17a. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that the world grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened and with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Inner man is kind of the key words of these verses. Uh, Paul used his usual phrase to refer to human abilities or faculties such as conscience or the will God told Samuel to consider a person's heart, not the person's external appearance. Are we guilty of that today? Do we sometimes judge people by their outward appearance rather than what they have to say or what they stand for? Do we, do we even look to see what they stand for? Or do we prejudge them immediately based upon their looks, their dress, uh, demeanor, other, other characteristics that show without having ever heard a word from that person? That is not how we are to judge people. We are not to judge people. Judge not be not judged. In verse 4, <coughs> Paul often prayed for the churches he had established and other Christians. Although he mentioned many issues in verses 14 through 17a, he specifically wanted his readers to experience the power and presence of the risen Christ in their lives. Earlier in the letter, he noted gratitude for them and his desire that they be strong. Mature disciples, do not lose heart. For this cause is repeated from verses, chapter 3, verse 1. 
For several verses, Paul had focused on the experience of Gentile Christians in the church. In verse 14, he moved on to highlight his prayer for the church. In these first three chapters, Paul had noted many important beliefs, including salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. Although to some readers today, Paul may appear to be a theologian digging into deep subjects, his pastoral heart services again in this passage about prayer. Paul wrote that he would bow my knees as he prayed. He might have literally gone to his knees. The typical Jewish man would stand while praying. Sometimes, however, a Jew would kneel. For instance, King Solomon knelt when he prayed at the dedication of the temple. Daniel regularly prayed on his knees. Jesus knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane. So many of you may also pray on your knees to show respect and reverence to our God. Paul prayed to the Father. Well, Paul mentioned all three persons of the Trinity in this letter. He prayed to the Father here. Jewish, a Jewish Christian would know that God is the Father of all humans in general, and the father of the nation of Israel in particular. Christians know that in a unique way, Jesus is the only begotten. Jesus had addressed God with the Aramic word Abba, pointing to an intimate personal relationship with God. In verse 15, Paul's main point is that our understanding of human families and fatherhood is related to our divine father. Jesus taught his disciples the prayer often called the Lord's Prayer, which begins with our Father which art in heaven. Paul did not mean that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were literally a heavenly family. Some scholars think Paul here re reflected the speculation of some Jewish rabbis of the day about a heaven family that included the angels. To paraphrase Paul, our human understanding of the best traits of a father reflect the traits of God the Father. Some readers, however, might have had abusive fathers. Reading this verse might be more challenging for them. Jesus compared the love of a human father to the love offered us by God. In verse 16, Paul moved to the heart of his prayer for the church at Ephesus. The prayer addressed to God. Now we see what we might call Paul's prayer list. Throughout his letters, Paul mentioned many prayer concerns, some specific to individuals or congregations. The acrostic ACTS, A-C-T-S, is a way of categorizing types of prayer. A refers to adoration or praise. C refers to confession of sins. T denotes thanksgiving. S represents supplication or any prayer in which we ask God to do something. The prayer in this section of the Ephesians is primarily supplication, especially intercessory prayer, Paul praying for them more than for himself. Paul was always concerned about young Christians becoming more mature in their walk with Christ. Christians were in the majority in a pagan culture in the first century, so they faced many challenges. Paul wanted them to tap into the power of the triune God. They would not face its obstacle alone. 
God would strengthen them, and as the body of Christ, they could encourage each other. Paul assured his first century readers and us that they could be strengthened with might. When they wore, when they felt weak, they should call on the power of God as a steady resource. Some Christians speculate about God's omni, omnipotence. But Paul highlighted God's power as a source for the Christian life. When Paul prayed for relief from the thorn in his flesh, he learned about God's power. He told the church at Philippi that God strengthened him while he was in prison. Riches of his glory. In the Bible, the glory of God is usually his majesty or radiance often manifested in light. The biblical authors generally stressed our having a personal relationship with God using such terms as Father for God. Here Paul featured God as the power or energy source for those who might be struggling in the Christian life. Paul wrote to the other church. Paul wrote to another church God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Although Paul emphasized the church as the body of Christ in this letter, he did not forget about the concerns of individual Christians. He prayed God would strengthen each believer in his or her inner man. Paul was concerned about the total person, not just spiritual issues, for example, when he warned the church at Corinth about sexual immorality, he noted that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. When Paul mentioned a person's inner man, he probably meant abilities human have, such as reason and a conscience. Paul referred to the Holy Spirit many times in his letters. Sometimes he dealt the controversial issues but more often he dealt, he dwelled on the way the Holy Spirit is a resource for daily living. Have you ever thought of the, of the Holy Spirit that lives within you as a resource for daily living? Something that can furnish conviction and power and strength to do what is good and right? That we can draw on that anytime we need it all day long? God's Spirit energizes the early church in a dramatic way. Paul stressed we should walk in the Spirit and manifest the fruit of the Spirit. In verse 17a, another way God strengthens His people is by the indwelling of Christ in our hearts. Although Paul typically described a Christian as someone in Christ, here he noted Christ being in us. Here Paul did not mean the muscular organ that pumps blood. For biblical writers, the heart represented our basic character or selfhood, sort of like the inner man in verses 16. Bible scholars note that the word dwell suggest a long-term relationship, not a temporary visit. Uh, to recap a little bit, culture tends to reduce prayer only asking God for tangible things in times of pressing need. Christians, on the other hand, should hold a much wider view of prayer. Don't let wrong, don't get me wrong, excuse me. God assuredly cares about our needs. 
and he wants us to ask him for our needs. In another letter, Paul said we are to pray about everything. We should keep praying for God's provision in our lives, but prayer involves much more than asking for our own concrete needs. Prayer for others, not just ourselves. We should especially pray for fellow believers. God is the one of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We should pray for believers in our church and around the world. Pray for spiritual needs, not just physical needs. Like Paul, we can pray that God would strengthen our brothers and sisters through the Holy Spirit's power. Humanly speaking, obeying God rightly is impossible. If we are to have any hope of regularly following what our Heavenly Father has commanded us, then we must depend on His power. The reality is we are desperate apart from His power. So we pray to be strengthened with power from the Holy Spirit, and we are to pray that same prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ. All of these spiritual realities grow through prayer. God uses the prayer of fellow Christians to empower our obedience, comfort our hearts, mature our faith, and we can pray that he will do the same for others. Our next scripture reading comes from chapter 3, verses 17b through 19. 17b. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints that is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height, and to know to love Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul continued his prayer for the Christians in Ephesus. Here he put forth his desire for the spiritual and moral development of his readers. He hoped they would develop a deeper sense of God's love. He mixed two world pictures together as he wrote, Rooted and Grounded about their life in Christ. Rooted is an agricultural image, reflecting the planting and growth of a flower, bush, or tree. Grounded could be rendered established and points to the analogy of the church as a building with a strong foundation. Earlier, Peter had mentioned Jesus as the cornerstone of the church. With either the agricultural or construction word picture in verse 17, Paul emphasized the role of love in the growth and maturation of Christian life. Paul dealt with the topic of love in many letters, with 1 Corinthians 13 perhaps being the most familiar to readers today. The Greek language had many words translated love, but Paul typically used agape, the kind of love God has for us. Agape is a sacrificial, unselfish love that should characterize the Christian life. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. In verse 18, Paul prayed that Christians would begin to comprehend the love God has for his people. One way to paraphrase Paul's point is that he wanted us to wrap our minds around the immensity of God's love. Paul also acknowledged love as God's motive for providing salvation for a lost world. God commandeth 
or demonstrated his love to us through the death of his son. As hard as we might try as infinite human beings, we cannot truly comprehend God's love. The immensity of God's love for us and his church is hard to capture. Paul knew that all saints shared the desire to understand and appreciate God's love for a deeper level. In verse 19, Paul's main point continued. He understood that Christ is the unique Son of God. Although ultimately Christ's love will surpass infinite human knowledge, we should strive to understand and respond to Christ's love as much as we can. Certainly, consistent study of God's written world will help us in this endeavor. You know, many, many Christians or people that claim to be Christians uh, do not read the Bible, uh, especially on a regular basis. They might pick it up once in a while, but very rarely, and they do not study the Bible, and therefore they do not get or understand the immense love God has for his people and for his church. As it says here, uh, consistent study of God's written word will help us understand God's love. Paul's prayer that Christians be filled with all the fullness of God might be puzzling to some readers. Paul used the ideal of fullness to highlight the full deity of Jesus as God's unique son. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Ephesians 3.19, Paul did not contradict his other writings. His point here was that strong, maturing Christians can have a long, intimate relationship with God. We are not divine as Jesus is, but in a sense God dwells in us to be full of God for us means to have a strong sense of God's presence and guidance in our daily lives. Paul knew the temptations that faced first century Christians. Their loyalty to God would be challenged on a regular basis. In a later letter, he noted that some people would become lovers of their own selves, covetous instead of lovers of God. Throughout his writings and ministry, Paul accented different characteristics of God. In this prayer, God's love manifested supremely in his Son was the main focus. In other letters, such as Romans, he referred to the wrath of God as well. Although sinners desire the wrath of God, deserve the wrath of God, because of God's love, salvation is available. So just the opposite, even though we deserve to be punished in God's wrath, the opposite is available through Christ's mercy and grace. He prayed for their growing comprehension of what God had done for them through Jesus. It's sometimes hard to grasp what a terrific thing that was that, that God's only son would die on the cross for our sins all the pain and suffering and humiliation he suffered uh, being an innocent person uh, for our sins is humbling should be humbling to every one of us and the resurrection that gives us hope and victory over death and hope for eternal life the whole foundation of our Christian religion Love is most definitely a feeling, and a very powerful one at that. But it is far more than a feeling. Love is actually an action. 
we see this play out in our own lives. For example, a father frequently tells his child he loves him, but he demonstrates that love by feeding him, clothing him, and sacrificing his time for him. Moreover, as a parent, the father sees the bigger picture of life. Just as a father installs a fence around the backyard to allow his young child to play freely while being protected from outside danger, so too God places boundaries around his beloved children in this world. Love is something we can do. Love in action. <coughs> <coughs> When it comes to God's love, we must also hold the feeling and doing in proper balance. That's what Paul was ultimately praying for the Ephesian believers, and it's what you and I should be praying for each other in Christ's church. Pray we would constantly remember that it was God's love that saved us, and it's God's love that sustains us. Pray we would grow in understanding the full measure of God's love and character. Pray would we be astounded by the sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross. If you look on page 116 of your personal study guide, You'll see some things listed in, starting in the last paragraph from page 116 and continuing on to 117. God is able to do more than we ask. It says, Paul challenged us with yet another principle of praying together in God's church. The principle has the possibility of radically changing our lives, affecting our worship, and altering our prayers. That principle is this. Prayer is not about us. It's ultimately about God and His holy and His glory. Paul finished his prayer with climatic words of worship to God. He didn't just tack on an amen. Instead, he prayed, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. God is able to do more than we ask. In contrast to the prayer and greatness of God, we tend to pray smaller, more limited prayers. In uh, page uh, 118 of your study guide, you have an exercise called Engage. I'd ask you to look at that, read it, uh, consider that, and, and complete that little exercise on your own. On uh, the next page, you'll sign, find the Live It Out. It says, How might you adjust your prayers to align more with the spiritual priorities of God? Consider the following applications. And it says, confess. To realign your prayer life in a more God-centered, others-focused direction, confess to God the ways you prayed in self-centered ways. Normally we pray for what we want and not necessarily for what is good for our country or our fellow man or even for our church. We should include all these in our prayers. We should think in a much broader mindset than our own personal selfish needs. Pray if you're not a regular disciple of prayer, begin now. Uh, try to pray on a regular basis. Improve our routine, if you would, of having daily prayer some quiet time with God.
Keep a journal of your prayer requests to ensure you are also praying for the spiritual and physical needs of others. And pray together. Of course, it says that in this lesson that the best way to grow in prayer is praying together in Christ's church. Or is about praying together in Christ's church. Commit to a regular time to meet and pray with one or two other believers from your Bible study group. Uh, this would suggest that uh, you join up with someone from your Sunday school class uh, and have uh, joint prayer or prayer together uh, on a regular basis. Maybe after Wednesday night services or before Wednesday night services or after Sunday school or before Sunday school. Uh, when we get back to meeting, face to face that is. Uh, this could also be conducted by phone. Uh, you could also contact someone with a phone and pray together over the phone. The idea is that, that uh, it's a way to grow in praying together and praying for each other. If we don't do anything but call a friend and pray for them and have the friend pray for us. The main thing is to engage in regular prayer and regular Bible study. Since God's glory is His top priority, it should be our top priority. Our prayer should also reflect His priorities. When we pray like Paul, our prayers will be more about God and His church and less about ourselves. Thank you for joining us today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for being with us during this study, Lord. Thank you for providing this scripture. Thank you for providing this study, this lesson. We pray that we take and understand this message and apply it to our lives, that we improve our prayer life, that we improve our prayer method by including prayer for others and for the church and for your goals in our lives and others' lives. Uh, we thank you that we have others praying for us, and we thank you that we have others to pray for. Help us to be mindful of their needs as much or more so than our own needs. Again, Lord, we ask that you be with the sick and these people that are exposed to this virus, that you heal them, protect them, until this virus has been wiped clean from the earth. And we ask that as quickly as possible, Lord. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.